Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jared Taylor, editor of American Renaissance. That was not worth a round of applause, but uh, I will nevertheless gratefully accept it. As some of you know, I have been an out-of-the-closet advocate for our people since 1990. That's 33 years. So I'd like to talk about some of the things I've seen and done, and maybe even a few things I might have learned on the way. When I first started, I was impossibly naive. I was just like James Edwards. I thought the facts about race are so clear and the legitimacy of white advocacy is so obvious that with just a few bits of reasonable persuasion, the country could be brought to its senses. <laughs> what a dope I was. And yet, in some respects, at the time I started American Renaissance in 1990, it was the opening of a kind of golden age of real discussion. American Renaissance started out as a print magazine, which some of you were kind enough to subscribe to. And whenever we would send out issues to talk radio stations, we would always get a handful of interviews, talk radio interviews. And many hosts were hostile, but none of them seemed to feel obliged to shout at me or insult me the way they would be likely to do today. And some of the, some of the hosts were extremely friendly. I don't know if any of you know the name David Brudnoy. He was a very popular talk show host in Boston. He knew my arguments so well, he could have made them all himself. And he used to always call black people Negroes. He said, they keep calling themselves something new all the time. I get confused. I'm just going to stick with Negroes. <laughs> Bob Grant was the most popular talk show host in New York City. And in 1996, he promoted the American Renaissance Conference on the air. He said this, these are outstanding speakers, and if I can, I'm going to take my microphone down there and tune in. This is on talk radio, New York City. Believe it or not, C-SPAN covered some of the speakers at the first two Amaran conferences, 1994 and 1996. And we might get a few demonstrators at conferences, but hotels, first-class hotels, were happy to take our business. Later, of course, we got ran out of the public sector, and that's why we're here. In the 1990s, I was invited on a slew of television programs, including the Phil Donahue Show twice, and I spoke at many colleges and universities explicitly on the topic of race and IQ. And the year I started American Renaissance in 1990, that was the year, the first reports of the Minnesota Twins study. This was the experiment in which they rounded up identical twins separated at birth who didn't even know of the existence of the co-twin and discovered how powerful, incredibly powerful genes are. This really made a huge splash at the time. There was also a very reasonable mainstream book on race and IQ called A Question of Intelligence that came out in 1992. That was also the year of the final report of the Minnesota transracial adoption studies. There were a set of researchers who were determined to prove that environment conquers race. And so they took black children and white children adopted in middle-class white families, and they followed them up through age 17. And they proved absolutely the opposite of what they had hoped to prove. Genes and race conquer environment. Can you imagine even trying to get funding for a study like that today? My own book, Paved with Good Intentions, it was about race. It was not only published by a mainstream house, it was widely reviewed, and it was the monthly choice of the conservative book club. The bell curve came out in 1994, and as you know, caused a huge stir. Philip, Philippe Rushton's Race, Evolution, and Behavior came out that same year, also kicked up a lot of dust. And in 1996, Richard Lynn published an even more scandalous book, Dysgenics. And that year, Peter Brimelow published Alien Nation. 1997, Michael Evan wrote Why Race Matters, and then Arthur Jensen published his great masterwork, The G-Factor. 
And throughout this entire period, Linda, Gottfried, Linda Gottfriedson of the University of Delaware was publishing very high profile papers on IQ differences in different groups and why it is catastrophic to ignore them. She pulled absolutely no punches. Now, some of these people may just be names to you, but they were credentialed academics published by reputable publishing houses. And three of them, Michael Levin, Phil Rushton, and Richard Lynn, spoke at our conferences. It was really a different era. Early in the decade, while this was happening, you could imagine that we were on our way to the day when at a PTA meeting, one of the women would say, uh, well, of course there are no blacks in the AP physics class. Remember, there's that 15 point average IQ difference. And then we go on to talk about the school Christmas party. <laughs> and you could also imagine we were on the way to the day when a United States Senator would say to a bunch of reporters, well, of course I live in a white neighborhood, don't you? I like living around white people. And what's wrong with white people wanting to remain a majority? Yes, I was foolish enough to believe we were moving in that direction. Boy, was I wrong. All those wonderful books that I mentioned had no effect whatsoever on public discourse or public policy. By the end of the 1990s, not only was there no progress in that area, there was a real clampdown. The Iron Curtain came down with a bang. And the new century brought us some utterly crazy ideas, some of the most obviously absurd ideas that I think have ever circulated since the scientific revolution. In 2000, the very year the new century began, Craig Venter, he was the head of the Human Genome Project. He announced at the White House that, and I'll quote him, the concept of race has no genetic or scientific basis. Bill Clinton was there. I can imagine him just beaming with happiness. At that time, I thought, how can a scientist say something so foolish? I thought, they must be joking. And yet, of course, now this is official doctrine. Australian Aborigines are no different genetically, biologically, spiritually from Koreans. And when our rulers actually got our people to believe that fairy tale, I knew we were coming into heavy weather. However, the, the 2000s brought something that was extremely encouraging, and that was a true free speech internet. Twitter famously called it the free speech wing of the free speech party, and it meant it. When I signed up for Twitter, there were only five things that you could not do. No copyright violation, no posting people's private information, no impersonation, no direct threats of physical violence, and no criminal activity. That was all. I'll repeat this. Don't post your ex's social security, card, social security card number. Don't advertise for a hitman for your mother-in-law. Don't peddle fentanyl. Don't pretend to be Britney Spears. All that is so reasonable. A true marketplace of ideas. Jefferson's ideal, the Athenian agora. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we know what happened to Socrates. And we also know what happened to the internet. Conventional media hated not being able to decide what we should see and think, read and hear. They'd always set the rules. And now they had to deal with all of these upstarts who had inconvenient, awkward facts and subversive arguments. And if you own a free speech platform and, the own, and your own ideas are constantly being trampled into the dirt you don't start thinking, gee, there's something wrong with my ideas. You begin to think the problem is free speech. And therefore, in a leftist liberal regime, censorship was inevitable. But there were certain events that became excuses for it. I'll look only at Twitter. In 2011, after he killed 77 people, Anders Breivik was banned from Twitter. Killing 77 people, that's pretty awful. But he was not banned because of his tweets, but for something he did offline. 
Banning him was a violation of Twitter's rules, a bad precedent. Likewise, in 2013, anonymous accounts were banned for so-called misogynist abuse. Whatever that is, it certainly did not violate Twitter's rules. And those bans were even before Dylan Roof shot nine people after a prayer meeting with them. Another pretty awful thing. He'd posted pictures of himself with Confederate flags, and this touched off a berserker, wild attack on the Confederacy, and people really started shrieking about the need to crack down on the Internet. Now, it is true that Dylan Roof got wise to race on the Internet. What set him off was hearing over and over how horribly racist it was for George Zimmerman to shoot Trayvon Martin. And he went to Wikipedia. And lo and behold, he discovered that this was a clear case of self-defense. And a jury had found that. And he poked around some more, and he learned about all kinds of black and white murders and was shocked. Black on white murders. He wrote, I realized something was very wrong. There were pages and pages of these brutal black on white murders. How could the news be blowing up the Trayvon Martin case while hundreds of these black on white murders were ignored? Well, how indeed? Inquiring minds want to know. Well, the only solution, obviously, was to make sure no future Dylan Roof found out about those brutal murders. Muzzle anyone who talked about them. But the real bloodletting came two years later after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Twitter then finally rewrote the rules to catch up with the reality, and Twitter said, we have the right to ban anybody, anytime, for whatever reason we please. And that was the end of the road for me and for thousands of other accounts. We mustn't forget that the election of Donald Trump also made our rulers hate free speech. It is a huge exaggeration to say that the alt-right memed him into the White House, but the Internet sure helped. And in 2018, someone at Google leaked a very important 85-page internal memo. It was called The Good Censor, and it never got anything like the attention it deserved. Oops. It noted, quite matter-of-factly, that Google, which owned YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, that we control the majority of online conversations and that free speech was getting out of hand. It said that we had to ditch the principles of free speech if free speech upsets people, and we should instead promote dignity over liberty, civility over freedom, and by controlling what people saw and read and ultimately what they thought, tech companies, the good censors, could stop bad things from happening. And they listed several bad things explicitly. One was the election of Donald Trump. One was the rise of the alternative for Deutschland in Germany. And also the horrible fact, the intolerable fact that racists, misogynists, and oppressors, to use their word, had just as much access to the public as good guys, like the New York Times. The memo was saying, if we silence our opponents, we can, in effect, rule the world. Tech billionaires would be the good censors. They would boss us around for our own good. A year later, in 2019, the New York Times ran a long piece called Free Speech is Killing Us. The next year, Barack Obama told us the internet is the single biggest threat to our democracy. Why is it always our democracy. I guess the internet is no threat to Japan's democracy or India's democracy, but here in America, we are the font of liberty, the leader of the free world, and democracy will die if Alex Jones gets on YouTube. <laughs> what, what pathetic worms our rulers are. And of course, And of course, uh, the white supremacist armed insurrection. That was the icing on the cake for the censors. And then there was COVID and the glorification of the sexually confused. And this unleashed a lust to censor so libidinous that even under Elon Musk, I and James Edwards are too dangerous for Twitter, even under its new name. Boys and girls, this very meeting is apparently a threat to democracy. 
<laughs> but the most critical date in this little history is one that many of you will recognize, May 25th, 2020. That is when George Floyd laid down his life for all mankind. <laughs> and it was surely in his honor that four days after he ascended into heaven, we lost our YouTube channel. But that one death, of course, set off such a festival of looting and arson that no fewer than 200 cities had to establish curfews. 30 states called out the guard. And it was also a new kind of rioting. It wasn't just in the Negro Quarter, as it always used to be. Rodeo Drive, the Miracle Mile, the fanciest stores on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan sacked and looted. A friend who lives in Chicago, he walked out and he saw so much plate glass all over the sidewalks, he called it Kristallnacht for white people. <laughs> As usual, white people understood nothing. They persist in thinking that blacks are roaring and looting. There must be some terrible injustice that causes this. They refuse to understand that some people just roar and loot whenever they can. And for the first time, and this is important. Lots of white people took part in these mostly peaceful demonstrations and even in the free back to school shopping. But something else I think was even more important. Wikipedia lists 238 statues and monuments either torn down by the mob or dismantled by the authorities in case their poor little deers hurt themselves trying to push them down. That included more than 100 Confederate monuments, but also statues and monuments to Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Andrew Jackson, Kit Carson, Francis Drake, Louis XVI, what'd he ever do to black people? <laughs> <laughs> and seven statues of a bona fide Catholic saint, Junipero Serra. And also 37, count them, 37 monuments or statues to Christopher Columbus. Why Columbus? Well, during the race riots in the 1960s, no one would have thought of taking down a statue of Columbus to appease angry black people. But the George Floyd riots, the F George Floyd riots, they were not only, even if incoherently, pro-black, they were viciously and explicitly anti-white. This was new. <laughs> You see, Columbus was patient zero, who infected the whole Western Hemisphere with that terrible disease, the white man. The very presence of white people is a crime, and you show solidarity with blacks and all non-whites by destroying everything that celebrates any white person. And I mean any white person. On the campus of the University of Oregon, there was a statue to the pioneer mother. What was her crime? She had white babies, and the mob tore her down. America had been drifting into this explicitly anti-white stance for years, but this was a real sudden turn for the worst. There had always been this kind of anti-white hatred out on the periphery, but I never expected it to slam right into the mainstream the way it did and to no resistance. Now it's all white people not just Confederates or slaveholders, but white mothers. Every single white person is a criminal. How in heaven's name did we get here? Well, I'll tell you. And now I will talk almost exclusively about blacks because it's mostly blacks who are the source of the fantastic absurdities that are wrecking our country. In the 1950s and 60s, the race problem was very simple. There were certain laws that discriminated against blacks. There were certain white people who did bad things to black people. So the solution was going to be easy, make it illegal to discriminate, ridicule the racists, and pretty soon, black people would be just like white people. Well, that sure didn't happen. It didn't happen despite the fact that after blacks got equal rights, very quickly, they got special treatment. And so we staggered through the 1970s, the 80s, the 90s, right into a brand new century, and through eight whole years of Barack Obama's transformational presidency. Remember, 
He was going to transform the country and be going to be post-racial. And did this any good? No. Life was still not a Coke commercial. So here was the essential and terrifying logical problem. Either blacks weren't exactly like white people, or America and its white population were much more racist, much more vicious than we had ever imagined. But the idea that blacks weren't exactly like whites was verboten. The obligatory starting point of every discussion about race was the assumption that every single population group in the world is absolutely equal right down to the tenth decimal point. And then to drive a final stake through the heart of the idea of race differences, we banished the fact of race itself. Race is just a social construct. I still don't understand how white people are to figure out whom to oppress if race is some kind of optical illusion. How do we figure that out? Police can't go out and beat up a social construct. You know, it reminds me of an old Sam Gross cartoon in National Lampoon. It's a picture of a black guy. He's got dark glasses on and a white cane and a tin cup. He's got a sign around his neck that says, please help me. I'm blind and I think I am black. <laughs> but since race is gone, which makes racial differences logically impossible, how come mysteriously racism is ever more vicious and powerful than ever? To keep black people in the miserable state in which we find them, racism has to be grinding them down mercilessly, day in, day out, everywhere, always. So, leftists came up two ways, two ways to fight racism. The first was to stamp out every possible hint of anything that could be called racism. For example, as you know, just by speaking, white people unleash terrifying waves of racism that can knock black people flat. It has been scientifically proven that every time a white man utters a word that rhymes with trigger, a black person goes out and shoots someone. He's forced to. Every time a white woman utters that with that astonishingly powerful word, it literally forces a black girl to get pregnant and drop out of school. Talking about a master bedroom reminds them of slavery makes them go shoot people. Talking about field work, that reminds them of the master's lash. Painting your face black because you want to go to a costume party and like Michael Jackson, oh boy, that must cause at least five 14-year-old black girls to get pregnant instantly. Ask a black woman about her hair and her soul will shrivel. These things have been all scientifically proven. It is also impossible for black people to learn anything in a school named after a slaveholder. Doesn't matter if he's the father of the country. Walking by a Confederate monument, that makes them think of going out and mugging someone. And any talk of black crime paralyzes them with rage and even worse, it tempts white people to think impure thoughts. Even mentioning the race of a violent suspect that causes so much trauma that the police will now tell you to be on the lookout for a man in blue trousers and a white t-shirt. At least for now, he can tell you to look for a man. <laughs> well, every act of white people, every word, every thought has to be scrutinized and monitored at every moment to make America safe for the incredibly tender and delicate feelings of black people. During the BLM riots, you can see photographs of young white women walking around with signs that say, white silence is violence. You couldn't even have a quiet cup of coffee without kicking a black man in the shins. So that was the first thing, terrorize white people and stamp out the faintest trace of what might once have been imagined to be something like racism. And the second was to adopt something that had been around since at least the 1980s, critical race theory. Now, the genius of CRT is that it explains devastating racism without racists in the ordinary sense. Racism used to be deliberate acts by bad people. Well, not anymore. It can be unconscious. It can be so subtle that only experts can detect it. And sometimes even they aren't sure. But we know it's there. Just look at the mess black people are in. That's all the proof you need. CRT tells us 
that our systems and institutions were designed by very, very crafty white supremacists that built it all into the system, and our systems are still drenched with white supremacy, even if no one can show you exactly where it is. I recently read an article in Forbes about white supremacy. The author was a black woman, a certified DEI specialist, so she should know. And she wrote, we frequently uphold white supremacy in our lives without even realizing it. Nice people can also be white supremacists. Good grief. That means even nice, sweet, ni even nice white people are filled with the spirit of the lynch mob. And earlier this year, as many of you know, five black police officers in Memphis beat a black man to death. MSNBC figured out that this was white supremacy because the black officers were trained in a system rooted in anti-blackness. A congressman, a genuine elected congressman, Maxwell Frost, said the murder of Tyree Nichols is the result of white supremacy. I guess white people are just pumping white supremacy into the air. Oh, look out, there it goes. You know, it's floating around and it even enters the minds of black people and turns them into monsters. Of course, this is cuckoo. It's magical thinking. It's just the most pathetic voodoo. You might as well say that getting up on the wrong side of the bed or breaking a mirror makes black people fail. Now, the left loves to say that anything it disagrees with is a conspiracy theory. Well, this CRT foolishness and white privilege, that is the biggest, most absurd conspiracy theory going. And what is CRT's crowning insight? It's that white people are inherently oppressive. It's in our nature. We are born that way and cannot be fixed. Logically, the only solution is extermination, and some blacks publicly call for that. But before that blessed day arrives and we're all gone, we can do two things. We can do two things. We can look at all the rules of civilized life and find the ones that blacks are less likely to live up to and eliminate those rules because they're obviously racist. Yes, blacks are a lot more likely to be arrested for fair beating, shoplifting, public drunkenness, vagrancy, etc. So we decriminalize these things in the name of anti-racism and watch what were once beautiful cities become wrecked. Now, do white liberals, do they really want to step over zonked out junkies on the way to work? Do they want all the drugstores boarded up because shoplifters cleaned out the shelves? Do they really want to live in cities that stink of urine and feces? Do they want carjackings to double in a year? Well, here I have to disagree with Gregory Hood. They don't. But all of those things are better than admitting that they are wrong about race and we are right. So black people flunk job tests, throw them away, and hire incompetence. No blacks in the gifted program, get rid of the program. Too many blacks violating the honor system, get rid of that. Blacks getting bad grades in math will pump every single lesson full of social justice. And the other thing we can do is called equity. Not equal treatment anymore. Oh, that's so 20th century. Equity means taking from whites and giving to blacks until they catch up. Well, that, of course, is impossible. So this means never-ending programs of injustice against whites. And reparations? Of course. 60 years of equal treatment and even preferential treatment didn't work, so we take billions and billions and billions from white people and give to black people. San Francisco says that each black person deserves $5 million. Nothing too good for the victims of America's original sin. So yes, the country is destroying itself. Voltaire said, if you can persuade people to believe absurdities, you can persuade them to commit atrocities. And every day we see atrocities born from the absurdities that at least so many people pretend to believe. Because once you outlaw the truth about race, 
all of this becomes inevitable. If CRT had existed, it would have had to be invented. This denial of reality may be the most colossally damaging denial of reality in history. It's the key idea that justifies our destruction. The denial of racial differences mean that white people are by definition guilty without appeal of crimes for which liberals seem to think the only appropriate punishment is our extinction. If the country understood race, none of this could have happened. Denial of race is the logjam that makes it impossible to talk sense about anything from crime to immigration to schools to policing or even to the right of white people to survive. To try to run this multiracial mess while ruthlessly forbidding anyone to understand race is like ordering NASA, send people to the moon, but don't even consider that nasty, hateful concept of gravity. You get dead astronauts. And what does the system do for blacks? Well, it teaches them. Nay, it implores them to hate us. How could they not hate us? We're, we were born to oppress them. And I wonder which blacks hate us most. Is it the ones that we have petted and coddled? The ones who go to Princeton on a full scholarship and then end up with these plum jobs and universities and media and have 200,000 Twitter followers? Just read what they say about us. Or, if it's not them, is it the feral blacks who beat up white children on school buses? Take your pick. There is plenty of hate to go around. Two years ago, Charles Murray wrote a book called Facing Reality. It's about two things, black IQ and black crime. Unlike the bell curve, this was completely ignored. Because of what he was saying, if we don't face reality, this country is finished finished. And the country brushed his book aside as if it were fly specks. Charles Murray now has given up. He says the country is hopeless and can't be saved. Now Murray is not one of us, but at least he sees what's at stake and is willing to talk about it. What about all those other so-called conservatives? It was their job to stop this foolishness in its tracks. It was their job to laugh CRT right into the next county. But with all their millions and all their think tanks and all their senior fellows with their fancy Ivy League PhDs, the best they can come up with is fatherlessness, a dysfunctional culture. They'd slit their, they'd slit their wrists before they pronounced two letters of the alphabet, I, Q. They are such miserable, miserable cowards. <laughs> now, <clears throat> some of you are thinking that my tale of the last 30 years is all bad news. But to paraphrase Dickens, these are the best of times, even if they are the worst of times. This is the winter of despair, but also the springtime of hope. This is an era of foolishness. It is also a reason of the age of wisdom. The censors are failing. No matter how hard they try, our numbers grow all the time. Never have I seen so many knowledgeable, committed, determined white people. Never have I seen so many men and women in so many places, in so many ways, building race-conscious communities and organizations. They help each other. They celebrate marriages and births. They educate each other's children. They observe holidays together. And they live as authentic, community-minded white people, even inside this poisoned country. Do you remember the slogan, think globally, act locally? Well, that's what they're doing. These people know the worldwide threat we face, but we face, but they are making their corner of the world a healthy place for white people, especially for white children. Children have to feel that it's not just mommy and daddy. It has to be their homeschool mates, their best friends. Their, their mother and father's friends, all are self-conscious and proud white people. Some people are taking over existing, existing organizations, the Moose Club, Odd Fellows, Rotary Clubs. These places are desperate for members, for people to serve on committees. Some of them have money and buildings that are ready to fall into the hands of any smart, motivated group. And today, more and more white people 
have the savvy and the commitment and the talent to harvest this fruit. So this is not the time to sit at home, join a group, start a group, take over a tottering organization. There are more opportunities than ever. At the same time, this system is so absurd and the atrocities that it engenders are so egregious that it is dying even as it appears to be at the height of its powers. Why must it lash out so viciously? Do confident rulers pervert the law, silence dissidents, arrest the opposition candidate? No, terrified rulers do that. And what is the vision our rulers offer us? More dying cities, more predators, even on their own streets. Orthodoxy is always the most viciously violent when it dies. And finally, I'll get around to the subject of my talk, which is reflections on the last 33 years. There have been costs. If I had trimmed, trimmed my sales, I would have made a lot more money. I might have been a fancy conservative think, think tank operative. Uh, no. I would certainly have saved my children from taunting and harassment by schoolmates, but they handled it very well. And a life with a purpose has changed me as I slowly shook off individualism and became a white man. I began to understand the beauty and necessity of thinking far, far beyond my own interests. Some of you have seen me lose my composure at this very podium when I talk about our duties, our obligations, loyalty, commitment, the struggles of our ancestors. I hate it, but I begin to weep when I talk about these things. These deep emotions have taught me things I might never have known. What it means to have an attachment to something so much greater than myself. So yes, I know why the Spartans, thought, the Spartans fought at Thermopylae. Surely I would have been there with them. But I also know why kamikaze pilots stepped into their planes for the last time. I know why those fine Frenchmen, Germans, and Brits slaughtered each other so desperately on the banks of the Marne. I even know why Muslims have become terrorists. I'm profoundly moved by the nobility of facing death in the name of something greater. So there have been costs, but the rewards have been immense. I have the daily joy of doing my duty. Dries van Lagenhoven was explicit about it, but I'm sure the other speakers at, the, at this conference will tell you the same thing. No price can be put on the exhilaration of doing what you know is right. I can live this life of joy and fulfillment only because of you, only because the people who support American Renaissance. I cannot thank you enough. My final reflection is this. If I had not chosen this path, I never would have met so many marvelous people. I'll mention only those who have died. Glade Whitney, Sam Francis, Joe Sobern, Phil Rushton, Bill Regner, Louis Andrews, Martin Rojas, and as I said last night, Richard Lynn. It was a privilege to know these men. But look around you. Look at the wonderful people in this room, friends, comrades, supporters, from across America and even around the world. For me, it's a joy and an honor and an inspiration to be in this struggle with you and to know that the future of our people will be in such capable, powerful, courageous hands. We were born for this moment. This is the fight for which we were put on earth and it is in these hellish fires that greatness is forged and for those who choose it, their destiny will be greatness. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.